Hey guys, welcome back. In this lecture, we are talking chronic kidney disease, i.e. CKD. Now, in this lecture, we will go over how to appropriately stage CKD and the purpose of doing so. Additionally, we will discuss the association between CKD and cardiovascular disease, including the risk factors that put a patient at a higher risk for each. We're also going to discuss how to manage CKD, as well as the numerous complications that may arise in a patient with this disorder. So, chronic kidney disease is a diagnosis that we give a patient once their kidney has been damaged or the kidney function has decreased for at least three months. Anything less than three months is known as AKI, acute kidney injury. Sometimes clinically, you may also hear physicians mention subacute kidney injury. And this is usually referring to kidney injury developing over more than 48 hours, but less than three months' time. Now, for the purpose of the step 2 CK, acute versus chronic is going to be the main distinction that you're going to be responsible for knowing. And that begins, of course, at the three month mark. Now, kidney damage can be established by histology from kidney biopsy or from imaging studies, and damage can be inferred from increases in urine albumin excretion. The kidney function can be measured, of course, with GFR. So after we've identified a patient with kidney damage or decreased function of a duration lasting how long? Three months or longer. The next step is going to be staging the category or staging the degree of CKD. Now, to stage CKD, you're going to consider the cause. We're going to consider the G stage as determined by GFR, as well as the A stage as determined by the albumin excretion rate. And we'll talk about those on the next slide. Now, CKD is staged in this way because it allows us to better identify patients who are at risk for progression, complications, as well as for determining which treatment plan would be most appropriate. Now, patients with CKD, they are at a higher risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, higher risk of malignancies, infections, as well as just overall mortality. And so that's why staging and appropriate management is so critical. As CKD plays a huge role in the patient's overall health, we need to make sure that we know what's going on so we can treat it appropriately. All right, now when it comes to chronic kidney disease stages, let's start with the GFR and the G stage. So although the, G, the uh, stages are G1 and G5, you can see we actually have six stages. That's because G3, we separate this into G3A and G3B, depending on the patient's GFR. Now this division of GFR between uh, stages 3A and 3B was put into place following studies indicating a strong risk for mortality and adverse kidney outcomes when the GFR was lower, with those in the 30 to 44 range faring worse than those in the 45 to 59 range. Hence, separating these different patient populations based on that. Now, to be clear, even in the same stage, the lower the GFR, the higher risk of complications. Additionally, urine albumin levels have been staged from A1 a3. Higher albumin excretion rates have been linked to increased risk for the progression of CKD, for the development of end-stage renal disease, and of course for increased mortality. These risks are independent of the patient's GFR stage. Keep in mind though that the GFR stage is a stronger predictor of CKD complications than is the urine albumin stage. Then, after you have the A stages and the G stages, can plug your patient's value into a grid. Now, keep in mind, you do not need to memorize this for your exam, but you do need to know how to apply it. Now, based on the patient's A and G stages and where they line up on the grid, we can identify them as being either a moderate risk, high risk, or very high risk category. And this also determines the frequency of lab monitoring that they're going to need to undertake each year. So obviously, if you look at this, a G5 and A3 is expected to have the worst outcomes and, of course, will require the highest level of monitoring. Now, here's a slide showing you the risk factors for cardiovascular disease that, when present, are associated with worsened kidney function, as well as CKD findings that will negatively impact cardiovascular health. Make sure you know these. So here you can see on this slide the main recommendations for treatment and risk reduction. A statin is used when our GFR is less than 60% if the patient isn't on dialysis. When proteinuria starts, we know we're going to start them on an ACE inhibitor. Now, of course, don't forget the, the high-yield uh, step one 
nugget of if they're coughing with the NACE inhibitor, would we switch them to an ARP? Just wanted to repeat that. You'll probably see that on this exam as well. Now, the greatest benefit in tighter blood pressure control is seen to a very substantial degree when the proteinuria exceeds 3 grams per day. But a modest benefit is seen when this tighter blood pressure control is applied to patients who are excreting between 1 and 3 grams per day. No benefit is typically seen in the stricter blood pressure recommendations if the patient is excreting less than 1 gram per day. So keep that in mind if they give you these values in a vignette. Now, when it comes to management, the first step is to treat reversible causes of kidney injury. So what does this mean? Stop nephrotoxic drugs. Correct hypovolemia. Relieve any obstruction. Whatever the appropriate treatment is for that individual's cause of CKD, you want to work on treating it if it's reversible. Once that's done, initiate strategies that will slow the progression of chronic kidney disease. And lastly, you want to treat complications that have arisen or are typical or are, are likely to arise as a result of CKD. And we'll go over those in the next couple slides, but this includes things like volume overload, electrolyte imbalances, metabolic disturbances, etc. Now, there's a mnemonic we use for knowing when dialysis is needed. That mnemonic is AEIOU. A stands for acidosis. E stands for electrolyte abnormalities, uh, things like symptomatic hyperkalemia with arrhythmias or serious ECG changes. And usually when potassium levels are over 6.5 and refractory to medical treatments, is this going to be an issue? Then we have the I, which stands for intoxicants. Uh, that could be things like methanol, ethylene glycol, lithium, uh, salicylates, really anything that can damage the kidneys. O is for volume overload. U is for uremia. Uremia can cause things like pericarditis, pleuritis, and encephalopathy. Also, not necessarily an indication for dialysis, but keep in mind that uremic bleeding can occur in patients with uremia as a result of impaired platelet function. So that covers the AEIOU mnemonic, but in addition to this mnemonic, we have um, some other indications of CKD, which you want to be uh, aware of. These are things like a worsening nutritional states. So if the patient's not eating, if they're nauseous, if they're vomiting, um, if they are losing a lot of weight. Also, if they have uh, significant cognitive impairment, as reported by themselves or maybe uh, family members, these are all... Um, additional indications, okay? Uh, and finally, if the patient's encountering a worsening of energy levels, if they are feeling just a sense of general malaise, that would be another indication to dialyze. All right, let's move on and let's talk about anemia and chronic kidney disease. So anemia will arise in CKD as a result of diminished production of erythropoietin by the kidney, okay? Of course, that is a hormone created by the kidney. This is going to result in an anemia that is a normocytic, normal chromic anemia. Before we start treating this patient, we need to do our due diligence and we need to make sure that the CKD is the cause. So that means this is a diagnosis of exclusion. So what are we going to do lab-wise if we suspect this? CBC with differential, reticulocyte count, serum iron, uh, TIBC, percent transferrin saturation, serum ferritin, B12, folate. As well, we want to check for a GI bleed. Now, once we've excluded, remember, it's diagnosis of exclusion. Once we've excluded other causes, we can treat with ESAs or IV iron. And the target is to maintain hemoglobin levels between 10 and 11.5 grams per deciliter. And finally, patients with CKD can develop failure to excrete phosphate, resulting in a compensatory hypersecretion of PTH, which will do, be uh, done to correct both the hypophosphatemia and the hypocalcemia. Now, there's also a secondary type hyperparathyroidism that can cause renal osteodystrophy. That can be characterized by things like osteitis fibrosa, osteomalacia, and or adynamic bone disease. And this is managed by restricting dietary phosphate and giving the patient phosphate binders, uh, calcitrol, and or calcium imedics. All right, let's finish the lecture with three content review questions. So go ahead. Uh, you can hit the pause button. I will give you 20 seconds on the clock. Figure this one out and then come on back. The correct answer here is D, 
dialysis. Next question, you have 20 seconds, go. The correct answer here is C. And your final question, 20 seconds on the clock, go ahead. The correct answer here is C, hypophosphatemia. All right, that is the end of this lecture. I'll see you guys on the next one.